<clears throat> Happy Halloween. We're filming this on Memorial Day. Oh shit, you're right. I... <laughs> no, I know. That's why I said it because you can cut it off right there if yeah, you want to. That's right. We can. Okay. Do you want to do that again? No, like I like that? it. Okay, you like that? I, I have no regrets. Okay. I'm not keeping all of this in the intro. You totally are. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> How many videos on Psycho as a franchise have we done? I think this will be your th third one? I, I think so. Well, we did the Clips Notes of Psycho. Psycho. Yeah. It's a great movie. And then Katie and I did Bates Motel last year. The, the TV movie. The, the, the TV the movie spinoff. Right. Yep. Give me that. Don't you get smarter, I'll brain you with it. Uh, so I've been wanting to do an episode on the sequels to Psycho for quite a while because I'm a nut about that franchise and I love it. And these films, Psychos 2 and 3 in particular, are kind of fascinating in their place in film history, especially in, in sequel history. Well, yeah, especially because I think there's, there's a history of sequels where today I think when we think of sequels, we kind of think, not necessarily prestigious, but we kind of think, you know, if someone talks about like a like an Empire Strikes Back, or a Spider-Man 2, or a Wrath of Khan, or something. That's something that's kind of taken seriously. Welcome to Miracle Pictures, the home of powerful movie moguls. Have your people call my people. If you don't have any people, well, call my people to get you some people. Even if those spawn sequels that aren't that great, it's kind of held on a certain level. Whereas back in the day, it felt like you would get this classic movie, and then there'd be a sequel, and it would be terrible and no one would really talk about it, you know, like Splash 2 or Grease 2 or something like that. Wait, 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 when you talk about like 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 great classics and they had sequels, your first thing you go to is Splash and Grease? Well, I mean... Like, I'm thinking like Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. <laughs> they made sequels to those? To Wizard of Oz they did. Sort of. It's kind Well, welcome to our film literates episode on Return to <laughs> Oz. <laughs> So there's this whole history of kind of forgotten sequels where one of those movies had a sequel and it was terrible. I'm just not gonna watch it. And the same was kind of true for for Psycho, you know, where there's Psycho 2, 3, 4, and I'm like, well, the original is so great. It's one of Hitchcock's best movies. And it's kind of the same thing with Jaws. You know, you got Jaws 2, 3, and 4, and it's like, well, I don't need to watch those because Jaws 1 is great. And then, you know, I come over here, and because I'm your friend, you make me watch Psycho <laughs> 2 and 3, and uh, I, I'm kind of not regretting watching them. Come on, let's get going, just like rain. I, I, I think a lot of people don't realize just how many great movies got sequels. Yes. Uh, I mean, everyone, I mean, a lot of people, I think, know about Return to Oz. Uh-huh. Uh, but stuff like, shit, I should have had a list in my head. <laughs> Great movie. Uh, classic. Weekend at Bernie's too. That got, got sequels. Oh. Isn't there a, there's not a Casablanca 2, is there? Uh, <laughs> Casablanca the TV show. Oh, okay, there's a TV show. the first show. thing that pops up. The Birds 2, that's right, there was a Birds okay. 2. Okay. Uh, easy Rider okay. 2. The Last Days of Patton. Oh, I think I heard Return that. to the role 16 years later in The Last Days of Patton. I think there are a bunch of these classic movies that people don't realize got sequels or uh, future adaptations trying to trying to, to build off of the success of those those great movies. So for instance, uh, Patton got a, a, a sequel on, like, on a TV. F*** me in the <laughs> <laughs>
He's slipping into insanity again. I can hear it in his voice. The whole reason that the Bates Motel is such a fixture on the Universal backlot is because of Psycho 2. Exactly. You know, the original set that had been uh, built there, I don't know if it had been taken down or moved or something like that, but it got put up during the production of Psycho 2, and then because they then went on and did Psycho 3 and all that stuff pretty shortly after, it became just a permanent fixture on the lot. So uh, the big... Uh, iconic image from Psycho that we all know that's, you know, there on the, the lot is only there because of the sequels. Psycho 2 is interesting because it isn't sh <laughs> Literally, Alfred Hitchcock dies in 1980, I believe, and then Psycho 2 comes out in 1983. <laughs> so that doesn't seem insensitive. It's, it's very easy to look at it and be like, oh, they would not have made this movie if Hitchcock were alive. And yet, when you look at kind of the behind the scenes of this movie, it seems like a lot of the people involved in it were very reverent towards Hitch Hitchcock. Yeah, director Richard Franklin, uh, is somewhat familiar with him. I don't know if he was quite friends with him, but yeah, he, he, he knew Hitchcock, and he yep. worked with Hitchcock, and he has studied Hitchcock, and he was like the ultimate fanboy. And it's He was it, the J.J. Abrams of Alfred Hitchcock. E.T., the extraterrestrial. It sounds like from the the uh, the commentary with the the, the writer Tom Holland, uh, it sounds like everyone kind of got involved because they liked the screenplay and they liked what he did with Norman Bates and where he took it. And that's really the strongest point about Psycho 2, is because if you're going to make a sequel to Psycho, you better have a good reason. And I think that Psycho 2 makes a case for itself. It could have just been a retread of the first movie where Norman Bates is at it again, luring people into the motel and killing them off. But the movie kind of flips the script in a sense, because in the original Psycho, we were already kind of slightly sympathetic towards Norman. Um, but I think in this one, we're entirely on his side because he gets out of prison. He's seemingly sane. And the whole movie is basically other people f***ing with his head. Hello? What? Who is this? My mother is dead. Mr. Toomey, if this is you, you're sicker than I ever was. We've seen Psycho 1, and we know how everything is revealed at the end, and we know mm -hmm. why Norman Bates is doing all this and his mother complex. It seems like th th there aren't any more mysteries, and they would just go back to the well of, okay, he's back in the house just killing people. This movie somehow pulls off a, a mystery where you're not quite sure what's going on, and you suspect that there's a chance Norman might be innocent. Norman, what did you put in my tea? The interesting thing is there's two kinds of suspense suspenses in this movie, which is the traditional kind, but then kind of the subversive, uh, dark comedy almost aspect to it where there's this level of suspense because we've seen Psycho and because we know who Norman Bates is, even though we've been presented to him as this guy who seems like he's kind of trying to rebuild his life in a positive way, you kind of go into these scenes and you kind of go, oh, I know how this played last time. And so you're kind of on the edge of like, is it going to play out the same as last time or is it going to be something else? And more often than not, it kind of will change its hand up a little bit because that's what they're doing is they're trying to play against the expectations right there. Even stylistically, they don't try to just be psycho over no. again. They do a lot of Hitchcockian shots. Well, yeah, both, it, both stylistically and narratively, it feels like it's building off that first movie as opposed to strictly copying it. You yeah, know. but it's it's absolutely to its core an 80s movie. I don't need any more. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that threw me off initially because there's a scene very early on where Norman walks into a diner and there are video game consoles and I believe one of them is Pac-Man. And it's just, that's something, you know, I've I've known, even if, though I hadn't seen Psycho for years growing up, you're very familiar seeing those images from the shower scene and other moments in the movie. So then to see 
Norman Bates standing next to a Pac-Man machine is very much like it doesn't fit. Part of that's also because it, it, Psycho was shot in black and white just mm -hmm. at the tail end of the 50s and it feels like a kind of a, a an edgier 50s movie. Yeah. Because uh, you know everyone's dressed in suits and everything's kind of formal and the way the shots are set up it's very crisp and clean and, and it it, it feels old school. Yeah. And to transplant that into the 80s when all of a sudden, you know, people are wearing these colorful shirts and Norman Bates is wearing, you know, these, these t-shirts and everything's kind of grungy and grimy and dirty. Yeah. And people are getting stabbed through the mouth. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is the the movie, I it's nowhere near as violent as other 80s slasher movies. No. Um, the, the slasher genre kind of you know, it started with Halloween, kind of back in... I mean, well, really started with Psycho, but kind of the the trend that we all think of with the 80s kind of starts with Halloween 1978. Mm -hmm. And that's a fairly bloodless movie. And as the decade goes into the 80s and then kind of progresses, it gets bloodier and bloodier. And so Psycho is in that weird area where it's, it's a pretty conservative movie for most of it, as far as, like, the graphicness of everything. But then there'll be a, a random bit of nudity, <laughs> whereas in the first movie they were very... Uh, careful to avoid all that because of the censorship at the time. But then even the violence, there will be some moments like Dennis Franz gets killed and he gets a quick slash across his face and then it cuts to black. And then there's the moment with uh, the teenage boy in the cellar where it's very uh, kind of, that kind of almost to me feels like the equivalent of the shower scene in that the way the, the kind of the montage is used, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of, obstructs the actual violence while giving you the same effect because it shows like jars of jam or something like that breaking apart that gives you the effect of blood without actually being blood. And then you have Vera Miles being stabbed through the mouth and it's like, what the heck are we watching? What kind of a motel are you running here? The kind that makes money. But it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great slasher moment though. And, yes. And I think Part of the reason that the violence feels so graphic is because the, the focus of the movie really is on the story and on the mystery, on the suspense, and there are a lot of, of talking scenes. Yes. And somehow it, it, it never gets boring throughout all those scenes. I'm, I'm still interested no. in, in seeing where they're going with this and how the characters interact. Uh, Anthony Perkins is great, yeah. you know, in yep. playing this kind of childish creepo character again. But, uh, but because of that, whenever the more graphic elements come in, it hits you a lot harder. Like, yeah. oh shit, this isn't just like and a I dramatic want, thriller. And I wonder if, you know, obviously watching Psycho 1 and Psycho 2, it's kind of unfair because there's a 22 year gap between the two of them. Mm -hmm. So when the original Psycho came out, people had this reaction to, to how violent it seemingly was and you watch it today and it's not that bad. And I wonder if in 1982 or three, whenever uh, they made it, uh, they thought, oh, we have to amp it up so that it still feels kind of graphic. And watching it today, you go, oh, it's not so bad. But, you know, it's kind of this weird thing of like, oh, we have to slowly amp it up, but not too much, you know? Watch out, Mike. Oh, jeez. If there's one thing that I don't care for in two, is is the the last minute twist, because you asked me early on when we were watching the movie who I thought the killer was, and I thought about it for a second, and I went, I think it might be Vera Miles, and not that they had to go with that option, but I think the the movie already does such a great job of putting all our sympathies with Norman and basically turning all the victims of the first movie kind of into ass this time and kind of trying to uh, set him up to get him recommitted. And so at that point in the movie, it would have made sense for that, but then pretty much halfway during the movie, you kind of re reveal that she's posing as mother, not necessarily killing anyone. Mm -hmm. does, is, does she actually kill anyone? They, they, they make it very explicit that she's not killing anyone killing because anyone. she wants to stop him from killing more people. yes she wants to well, so she wants to scare him into killing people so anyone anyone that dies in this movie is killed by mrs spool mrs spool spool yeah. or spoon mrs spool 
Is it Spool? Spool. Spoon. Is it Spool? So when it gets to the ending, and they kept talking about his mother being out there, it was kind of this thing where I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't know if that's gonna work for me. And they get to the ending and kind of everything wraps up, but the problem is you don't know who committed the murders. And I will say, I don't mind them picking Mrs. Spool. It's uh, Miss Spool, actually. Oh. Because I remember very early in the movie, wondering why she was being so helpful to Norman, despite her obviously having possibly lived in that town when those events were happening, versus other people who were being mean to Norman who maybe weren't even born when <laughs> that happened. Oh, oh, that's, that's beautiful. Go on, psycho, pick it up. Come on, pick it up. What's the matter, you lose your nerve, huh? Or do you only attack women? You know, so I think it's just the weird retconning. The woman you thought was your mother was my sister. I had you when I was very young, out of wedlock. That they later go to retcon in number three. Tell us all, kill your father in a jealous rage and kidnapped you when you were just a baby. So it's this weird thing where it feels like they didn't know what to do with Mrs. Bates and they kept f figuring that they had to keep messing with it in order to keep it fresh and whatnot. And I think it's the I think it's the one thing for me that takes Psycho 2 from being great, possibly great, to just being really good. And it's interesting hearing uh, the screenwriter, Tom Holland, talk about that mm -hmm. uh, because his defense for doing the the second mother ending is that he needed to pin the murders on somebody. Yeah. It's not a very strong argument. No. Because he, he, he didn't want it to be Norman. He was very specifically, he wanted Norman to kill nobody in the movie to and make it more And that's kind of the great thing when you yeah. come out the other side of the movie and you realize that Norman didn't kill anyone until, you know... I, I'll never forget the first time I watched the movie, and that ending happened, it's, and it comes out of nowhere. It's so great. And you get one of the best Oh yeah, because he just picks time. it up, and I don't even, every time, because we watched that scene a couple times, <laughs> and I somehow never noticed the shovel until right when he picks it up and just goes for it. So, cause you, so you're not even paying attention to it, and then he just swings. <laughs> And it's a great hit. It's, 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 I don't know, it's a very punchy, very funny, yep. out of nowhere ending. Yep. And I, I recognize that it's a non sequitur. It feels tacked on. It feels like it wasn't in the original draft of the script, which it was yeah. all along. That was their plan to do that. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, just the humor of it and is what the makes reaction it is what makes it work. Yeah. Psycho 3 is the flip side of Psycho 2. Because Psycho 2, we were talking about how it's got this, this great story, kind of makes a case for itself of why it should exist. Um, whereas Psycho 3 kind of feels like it bends over backwards to kind of homage and return things back to the way they were in Psycho 1. <laughs> I can describe a ton of those scenes that happen in the movie in great detail. I could not tell you what they mean <laughs> or what the context is or any of that stuff, you know? Psycho 3 has always struck me as being a very strange movie. And I think part of that's mainly because it's it's Psycho, but there are some just weird shit in there. I've had enough of this Nancy Drew horse shit from you. I'm letting it lie and so are you, you understand? Aren't you going to take him in for questioning or anything? Why don't you drag the swamp? That's where he dumped the last bodies. Don't tell me my job, Ms. Venable. Well, somebody has to. You're not gonna let him go. The whole nun religion stuff. Jeff, yeah. Jeff Fahey, like, Jeff. doing his, his, his thing lamp, with the lamps. lamps. And then, like, like kissing uh, mother. Norman's mother. And, like, like, all these very strange, off putting, creepy touches. But they're all kind of just shoved in there. Uh, like, the movie is more interested in the moments than it is in an actual cohesive story. I think a lot of that is because of Anthony Perkins. Well, that's that's the interesting thing is, so Anthony Perkins directed Psycho 3, 
and I, I think it's, it's really interesting to look at Psycho and kind of compare it to other horror franchises because most horror franchises always follow the villain. I think one of the rare examples of a horror franchise that doesn't really follow the villain would be like the Conjuring movies. And in the Psycho movies, you're always going to follow Norman Bates. But when you go back to Psycho 1, the focus is not on Norman Bates initially. You start with Marion Crane. And so the, the big twist of that movie is when she gets killed halfway through. But even then, if, if you're following Norman Bates, it's only kind of because he's consistent throughout the whole movie because then they kind of jump to Vera Miles and it's kind of like, well, she's the focus and we have to see her defeat Norman Bates. But then once the Psycho sequels take over, Norman Bates is very much at the forefront. And so you can kind of almost tell that Anthony Perkins in a weird way is like trying to claim that franchise for himself, almost in the same way as how like Wes Craven created A Nightmare on Elm Street and then kind of left. And so Robert Englund kind of takes over that franchise as Freddy Krueger. So it's interesting how a lot of these horror franchises start off as kind of auteur created and then they kind of let the, the face of the villain kind of carry it, literally in the case of Psycho 3 with Anthony Perkins directing it. The past is never really past. It stays with me all the time. And no matter how hard I try, I, I can't really escape. Psycho 3 builds very heavily off of Psycho 2, where you have the book that Meg Tilly's character was reading in Psycho 2. You see it lying around Bates Motel, yeah. just right outside in Psycho 3. And the whole plotline with Mother and what her situation is, it's all referenced and directly followed up on in Psycho 3. Yep. But Psycho 3 also takes it in a much further, crazier, more 80s, trippy direction. What are you doing with my mother? Don't you mean mummy? It almost feels like it bypasses kind of the 80s slasher in a way, and it almost gets closer to like the 90s uh, <laughs> erotic horror roadside thriller kind of thing. Like, you know, it almost seems like all these psycho movies are very reflective of the time they were kind of made in or what was coming up or what had just happened. So it would have almost been interesting to kind of see that go forward. <laughs> Full on, yeah, tasteless, kind of bizarre, yep. just upfront nudity and I sexuality mean, and violence. There's a whole there. scene where he kills a girl on a toilet and then spends like five minutes dragging her body around, and then they have a gag where like it's like he's having sex with her. And even like, that, even that scene has a a punchline of sorts, you know, with the the, the, the toilet paper roll and, yep. and everything. It's played up to be kind of shockingly, grotesquely funny. Yeah. Um, it's almost like it's the, uh, um, was it Friday the 13th, the, the New Blood, I think is the one I'm thinking about, which is the one where just kind of, you know, all, nothing's held back, everything's just kind of going for the sleazy mm -hmm. shock value. Yeah, but you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I don't know. I don't even know if I'm referencing the right rule no. when there's so many of those. It's kind of funny that we bring up the toilet murder because the original Psycho is so famous for being, I think, the first depiction of a toilet flushing on film. Um, and so it's funny that, like, 25 years later, they're able to have a girl get graphically murdered while peeing on the toilet. <laughs> In the same series. Yeah. <laughs> Progress. Jeez. You about scared the piss out of me. So Nick, mm -hmm. would you recommend Psycho 2? I actually would. Uh, and I would, I, I think I would almost aggressively recommend it because I feel like that's the way you have to now. Because so many people know Psycho is this classic so that when you tell them there's a Psycho 2, they're gonna immediately discount it the way I did for so many years. So I think I would kind of go out of my way to, to show people that movie mm -hmm. now. Would you recommend Psycho 3? Uh, Look. Norman Bates has had enough garbage dumped on him. If I already had to drag you kicking and screaming to watch Psycho 2, I probably wouldn't put the same effort in to watch Psycho 3. But if you're a completist or someone with terrible taste like you, then uh, it would be an easy 
uh, mild recommendation to watch Psycho <laughs> 3. Because I'd do it anyway. Yes, you would. I I kind of love Psycho 2, and I think I'm starting to like it more with time, the more often that I see it. Yeah. Um, I would I would recommend that movie to, 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 to most people. If you're a fan of the original Psycho, and if, if you're just a fan of kind of just 80s, not slashers necessarily, but kind of 80s thrillers in general, and you're a fan of Psycho, I would say yes, absolutely. See Psycho 2. It's, 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 it's worth it. It's got a lot of entertainment value in it. It's yeah. got a few surprises, which we just spoiled all of. Psycho 3 I would recommend as just kind of a weird curiosity. Um, if you like sleazy movies, and if you've seen the second one and you're curious to see where it goes, uh, I guess, no, I wouldn't recommend Psycho 3. <laughs> I honestly think if you showed someone Psycho and then showed them Psycho 2 right away, they probably wouldn't think there's that big of a dip in quality. Whereas if you went from Psycho to Psycho 3, I think they would very much agree <laughs> that it kind of went off the rails a bit. And I know we didn't watch uh, Psycho 4, mm -hmm. but that's just, that, that just a steep decline. Yeah. Just, just just right there. Of course, that's that's a straight to TV, and oh man, Psycho 4 is a mess. Next year, <laughs> Psycho, Psycho 4. Psycho 4. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta complete the package. <laughs>